Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Lagore, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. Uh, these are generally live episodes, but they are also recorded, so if you ever miss anything or you want to go back and check something out, you can always go back to our uh, YouTube channel and watch that. Um, we have every episode is different. Uh, first of the month, we talk about what's up in the nighttime sky, and then we also do episodes on equipment, helpful tips and tricks for imaging and observing, and then the last Friday of each month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. And today is no different. We have a uh, Dr. Vishnu Reddy from the University of Arizona is here today to talk about uh, his specialty in satellite uh, observations and asteroids and what he does with his students. Um, so I'm gonna bring him in now. He's joining us live from Tucson. Um, so uh, let me pop his window up here. Hey Vishnu, uh, thanks for joining us this morning. There we go. Uh, so um, I ask everybody the same question um, when we start this, and that's generally how did you get started in astronomy? And I've kind of read your bio, and I know we have some mutual friends as well. You have a an interesting start to your career in the field of astronomy. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are now? Sure. Uh, so um, I... I, I... I was born and raised in India, uh, at least the first uh, 22 years of my life. Uh, and I grew up in a place that did not have much power when I was growing up. So uh, most of my childhood, uh, at least in the evenings, we didn't have power. So I had no other uh, choice but to look at the stars, literally. Um, so you could only do so much work, uh, uh, you know, homework and stuff under candlelight. Uh, so I got interested in astronomy because we lived in a very, very dark site um, and we didn't have any power. So I started there, uh, did mostly naked eye astronomy. And then, you know, your usual stuff went through school. Uh, and then uh, at some point, you know, like I said, my grades were not that great to go into astronomy as a career at that time. And uh, so my uh, parents uh, sent me to a film school. So I, I, I worked in the movie industry for a while. Uh, and then I got tired of it and then, uh, uh, I became a, a journalist and I went to, back to school, uh, studied journalism, and I worked at a newspaper. I uh, wrote a lot about astronomy uh, while I was uh, at the newspaper uh, and also was doing astronomy as a hobby. You know, um, after uh, around the time I was in high school, I learned how to uh, make telescopes, so grind the mirrors and things like that. Um, so I built my uh, for, uh, first telescopes and uh, did a lot of visual astronomy. We didn't have anything uh, at that time. Uh, in terms of uh, CCD cameras and things like that. So mostly film photography, uh, painful guiding uh, film cameras manually. Um, and uh, so eventually, you know, while I was a journalist, I, I met other astronomers and I realized that, you know, uh, I like astronomy uh, so much that I wanted to, uh, that to become uh, my uh, career. Uh, and it was hard to switch from being a journalist to an astronomer in India. So I came to the US I uh, went to grad school uh, in North Dakota. Uh, I spent eight winters studying uh, astronomy and planetary science in North Dakota. And then, uh, yeah, I got my PhD there and uh, I worked all over the world uh, in Germany and Brazil and yeah, lived in Hawaii and then finally ended up in Tucson and uh, now I work at the UA. Very cool. That's, that's quite a journey to get, you know, to where you are now. And you're at this point now, so... Your, you have your doctorate, um, but you have you have your doctorate in several different fields, or what is your actual doctorate in? So my doctorate, so I have a, a master's in space studies and a doctorate in earth and planetary science. So that's basically, uh, you know, what the PhD is in. So uh, kind of like I use astronomy as a tool to study, you know, asteroids. So I kind of do geology with the telescope, so to speak. Sure. Yeah. Now you you've actually... Have you discovered asteroids? I think you have one named after you, but right, right, yeah. So I've, I've you know, I've discovered about twenty-two asteroids primarily as an amateur astronomer, um, uh, not as a professional, of course, as a hobby. I did it with uh, a friend of mine, uh, Roy Tucker, uh, here in Tucson. So that's how I found my asteroids. That's awesome. Now, um, 
So do you actually teach on campus uh, for the university? Yeah, so I teach on campus. Uh, I also do um, a lot of uh, research projects with students uh, and uh, try and provide them with actual hands-on uh, research uh, experience in astronomy and planetary science. And I feel that uh, you, you're able to do a lot of, uh, uh, you know, cool science with small telescopes. You know, most people would be able to do cutting edge research with a big telescope because uh, no matter where you point, you're trying, you're, you're bound to find something new uh, when you look with bigger glass in a different wavelength range that you normally do. Uh, but it's uh, definitely challenging to do cool science with small telescopes. And that's one of my uh, passions is like, what can you do with small telescopes, and I say small, it's sub-meter class telescopes. And these are telescopes that are currently being phased out of most universities or most national observatories like Kitt Peak, uh, because they cost a lot to, uh, you know, operate uh, and for, for good reasons. They need money also for bigger telescopes that are coming up online for uh, looking deeper into the cosmos. So what I have specialized and focused is to try and revive this you know, small telescope uh, science, so to speak, and provide hands-on experience to our undergraduate students and also graduate students. That's amazing. I, as someone who does outreach, I've seen through social media what you've done with your students and quite amazing because you really seem to like having them do it as a hands-on thing and not just, I looked it up in a book. And you've actually, as projects, have made several telescopes that are being used now, correct? That's correct. So... I had the opportunity, when I came to the University of Arizona, I had the opportunity uh, to buy telescopes yeah, and we have a few, uh, but at the same time, I thought like, wouldn't that be nice? I had some experience with telescope making and obviously, you know, we have a lot of resources here in Tucson uh, with small businesses like Starzona. Uh, so I thought, wouldn't it be nice that we take, rather than me going and buying a telescope, uh, my, uh, you know, to, to do research, uh, use, use the opportunity to, uh, maybe say take engineering students and try and build a telescope that would eventually used, be used by astronomy and planetary science students. So that's what, you know, I focused on and it's been very rewarding, you know, uh, to go through that process of actually having one set of students uh, learning the skills of building a telescope because they're engineers, whether it's mechanical engineering, optical engineering, whatever the uh, subfield is. And then once the product is made by these uh, students with the help of Starzona, um, we uh, we come in, the science students come in and use that product to actually do science, you know what I mean? So there's a multiple learning and teaching opportunities uh, when you're trying to, you know, uh, get research done. Now, um, for those of you who don't know, I, I have a 28-inch Dobsonian in the works, um, and a mutual friend of Vishnu's and I works at Star Arizona, his name's Scott Tucker. We've had him on when Star Arizona was on, um, become quite a optician himself, but um, not only making my mirror, but he's made several of your your project mirrors um, now. And thank you. I don't know how many you have of his optical systems now, but I know you guys are using them for various projects with the students. Right, right. Yeah, we have, I think at work, we have two and the one in my backyard uh, that's also built by Scott, the, the mirror is. Yeah. And the, uh, the OTA. Yeah. Now, the, the telescope in your home observatory and the ones on campus or what are the projects that you and your students are doing with those currently? Okay, yeah, I have some slides I can share, so that'll give some context. Let's see if I can share that. Let me see where's, there you go. Okay, can you guys see this? Hasn't shown up yet. There we go. Okay, so I, I just put in an overview slide of the work we do, and then some of the telescopes I use. You know, since this, this, I, you know, uh, this is going to be viewed by people who like telescopes. I put pictures of telescopes, and we can talk sure. about that. You know, uh, can never get bored of that, yeah. right? Um, uh, really quick, I don't mean to interrupt, just because sure. some people might not know, but um, even in your title, we said SSA, and mm -hmm. on um, your presentation it says SSA but for those of you who are not aware of what that stands for that's space situational awareness um, or kind of satellite surveillance um, I don't know if I could trouble you to kind of explain being that this is something that you do right to because that's it's not something that a lot of amateur astronomers might even be aware of it's kind of a right. 
it's a big niche of astronomy, but you, it's not in the mainstream news. So I didn't know if you could kind of explain what SSA is real quick. Yeah. So the, the next three slides are the introduction to SSA. Oh, so okay. That's what I, All right. Yeah. So I'll we'll let you get to it. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so the first thing is what you see here is an animation of the Earth. And I've, I've plotted the location of satellites as they go around the Earth. So there are different things you can see. The kind of small pink dots you see really close to the Earth here are satellites that are in low Earth orbit. You know, things like the Starlinks, everything else. You know what I mean? Obviously, these, the dots are not to scale. They're really enlarged so you can see it. Uh, but you can see that the orbital space around the Earth is, is pretty congested. The other thing you could also see is this line of dots that are, you know, a little bit further out, but they go around the Earth. So that, those are, that's basically the geostationary ring around the Earth. These are the geostationary satellites uh, that we get, you know, everything from weather to football to communication, all, all that stuff we get from these geostationary satellites. Now, if you can notice it, they're not equally distributed. There's a dense cluster of them on one side. There are gaps. There's obviously a big gap here. Uh, these are regions where there are no countries below the geostation belt. For example, over the Pacific Ocean, you don't have a whole lot of things going on except Hawaii and islands in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, whereas, you know, things like over Asia, things like over North America, you have, uh, you know, a uh, lot of satellites. And again, you will see, you know, uh, some, 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 some other satellites or some other objects that are drifted above and below it. These are objects that were launched into geostationary orbit at some point but are no longer station keeping or they're not maintaining orbit. So they start drifting up and above and below the geostationary belt. And of course you see, you know, things in highly inclined orbits. Uh, so the main point I want to tell is the, this orbital space around the earth is very, very congested uh, compared to what it was say at the beginning of the space age, obviously we've been launching stuff into space, you know, since the fifties. Yeah. And, you know, and things, it takes a long time to come down except for things in low Earth orbit. So imagine like, you know, it's it, it, since the invention of the automobile, right? Model T times, you know, you take the car, you're driving on a freeway. The minute your car runs out of gas, you literally park the car next to the freeway and you pick up a new car with full tank full of gas and you go forward another 300, 400 miles and then you drop it off again. What would happen in 50, 60 years? The highways will be littered with cars without gas, right? That's what we've been doing uh, to our orbital space because a lot of times these satellites might be otherwise functional, but run out of fuel to station keep. When I say station keep means maintaining orbit, maintaining its location in a certain orbit. And things really close to the earth, you know, they're brought down by atmospheric drag. Uh, but again, the atmospheric drag is a function of uh, the solar cycle, right? You know, the sunspot cycle. So when you have uh, increased sunspot cycle, the, the atmosphere expands and then it increases drag and it brings down the debris in low Earth orbit, uh, you know, uh, to some extent. But it, as you go beyond, you know, a, a few thousand kilometers uh, above the Earth, you know, anything you launch there is going to remain there uh, for the foreseeable future. They're not going to come back. And definitely things in uh, geostationary orbit or geosynchronous orbit, they're not going to come down uh, in any time uh, at all. So, so the stuff that goes into orbit stays in orbit. Um, that's the first thing I want to make. And so there's somebody has to keep track of this. So that's part of the space situation uh, awareness uh, uh, process. Uh, so here's a, a, a plot that shows uh, on the bottom axis is time. So you start in the 60s and goes to about 2010. On, the, you know, on this axis, you have number of objects and you have different color lines. There are rocket bodies, uh, there are mission related debris. These are the fairings that basically cover the satellite, you know, and they, you know, uh, come off at some point. Then you have the actual uh, spacecraft itself and fragmentation debris, you know, things that explode in space, either it's batteries or uh, satellites that malfunction, whatever it is. And this is the total number of objects. The important thing here is that you have a lot of objects in orbit. So we track about 25,000 of them, bigger than about a softball. And about, we expect, you know, um, you know somewhere between 300 and 600,000 objects, you know, about the size of a golf ball. And these are traveling at ex extraordinary speeds around the Earth, depending on its orbit. And so, again, somebody has to keep track of it. So part of doing SSA is that, you know. And the next slide. Oh, so, so the important thing to take, is, take away from here is that 90% of everything we track is, is junk, literally. You know what I mean? Uh, it's not active satellites. The active satellites make up very, very small percentage of the whole population that we have in space. 
And then I want to show a picture of uh, 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 the, a scene from the movie Gravity. And, uh, and this, this is actually, you know, a movie, but it's not too far from the reality if we continue down this path. So let me play the movie and then I will tell you what this, what is, uh, what we're seeing here. Hell out of here. Let's help there, man. No, don't wait for us. Stand down. Get the Yeah, I'll pause there. It's it's a long clip, uh, but oops, I'll go back. So what what we're seeing is you know the, you know they're working on, a, on on I think the Hubble use the space shuttle, which is you know they're all in low Earth orbit and there's a debris that comes in. Uh, hits this, you know, space shuttle, and then it creates more debris that's going to go and destroy other things. So this is actually called Kessler syndrome. You know, it's, it was, uh, you know, co coined by a person named Don Kessler at Johnson Space Center. And that basically says the density in low Earth orbit uh, is high enough that each collision, you know, for example, if there's a collision uh, that generates debris would increase the probability of further collisions, uh, you know, rendering all future space activities unfeasible. So it's kind of a cascading collision scenario where one collision will generate debris, it'll go and collide with other big pieces of debris, that will create more debris, and then it's just like a runaway collisional scenario. So we're, we're trying to avoid, you know, this situation. So what we try and do is part of uh, SSA sometimes is uh, uh, doing traffic up in space. It's called space traffic management. Uh, part of it is uh, make, uh, making sure that our adversaries, you know, don't do anything nefarious with our satellites, you know, uh, part of it is uh, compliance. You know, when you when your satellite is dying in a geostationary orbit, you're supposed to move it in a in a graveyard orbit so it doesn't collide with the others. Now, some satellite providers do it, some don't. So whether some somebody has to go and verify with the telescope that these people are actually doing it. So all this is part of SSA. Sorry, long answer for your question, uh, Kevin. No, but it's a it's an important. Um... It's, it's really interesting being in the telescope industry. It's kind of been a thing that a lot of manufacturers have looked at making equipment around. And it's kind of, it might seem like, why would they make that telescope? That's really odd from like the amateur perspective, like the Rasas from Celestron, for example. Um, they make the 8 and the 11 and the 14. And the 14 is very expensive for amateur Know, use and a lot of people think that's a little off base but the reason those exist are for this uh purpose okay. so um and like the hyperstars and uh, i know plane wave does a lot of work with this stuff so um various optics for different things but um you've gone to the next level on actually making your own equipment for this um and this particular application but this is it's a big deal um, for SSA work. It's a multi-billion dollar defense industry thing. So it's, but it's something that I find a lot of people aren't aware of um, at that point. Yeah, I think the, the issue is, you know, um, you know, human beings are very reactionary, right? Uh, if you see something, you know, you react better, right? You look through the, you know, look at the moon through the telescope. It's, it's you know, uh, it's a very, you know, uh, you know, a primal feeling when you get, when you look at the moon, the craters and stuff like that, right? You know what I mean? You see, you feel a connection to it. And the same thing with, if you look at the planets, you look at deep sky, ob deep sky objects, or when you do imaging and things like that. Um, the problem with, with, with SSA and satellites is that it's harder to connect simply because, you know, these are dots, you know what I mean? You know, the ISS, even though it's so, such a large structure, you know, that's the only one you could see very clearly uh, with the naked eye for most people, right? You know, for a common person, you know, of course you can see things up to six magnitude uh, with the naked eye. And then, you know, you can, can have people uh, out to show which one is what, but a vast majority of the objects in space, especially with, you know, uh, around Earth orbit are not like, you know, the, you can't resolve them with, with any, any decent sized telescope. And so it's harder to connect and see this problem because even though I say that the density is very high, you still have a lot of space. The problem is once you start this process of uh, 
as cascading collisional scenario, especially in a certain orbit, it, you just form a debris ring around the Earth where you can literally not launch any more satellites without getting whacked at. Mm. Uh, you know, so that's that's the challenge we have. You know, you know when you say it, you know that we have a big debris problem. It's technically you know an environmental issue in space. You know, it's not like it's not a visceral thing like you see a pelican in an oil spill or something like that. You know what I mean? It's hard for people to connect because you know, especially you know people in power like in Congress, because you look at dots, they don't get it. You know. But when you turn on, you know, your TV and your football is gone because the satellite got whacked by debris, then people start complaining, right? We're trying to avoid that so people have the services because we're so reliant on space for everyday activities from banking to cell phone to navigation, everything, you, you name it, you know what I mean? And there, um, I've been to some remote observatories for work and stuff like that. And there are companies that actually have telescopes that just sit there and watch their satellite in the area around it to make sure there's nothing going on. So it's it's kind of an out of sight, out of mind thing, but it's amazing when you start looking into this field how much investment has gone into making sure that your thing is, you know, safe from all this other stuff. So. Right, yeah. So we have billions of dollars worth of satellites that are just sitting there. There's no cops in space. You know, there's nobody making sure that nothing gets hit, uh, either traffic cop or rail cop, you know? Uh, so uh, it's a scary feeling, right? You know, you have, you know, a few hundred billion dollars worth of uh, uh, assets in space that nobody's watching over. And we assume that everybody's playing by good rules and they're not. And oftentimes, even if you, it's not about playing by good rules, you just have debris that you need to track continuously. So you know that your satellite is not going to get, uh, you know, impacted by this debris. Mm -hmm. No, it's. I know you could go on for hours about this particular subject because of how in depth it is. Um, so you you've actually taken a step further with your students to actually start getting their hands into the field um, with your own equipment. Um, how do you go about? You know, because it's such an oddball. It may be oddball from outside in, but from the inside out, it makes way more sense. But it's one of those things where it's it's not some some pretty picture in a textbook that entices someone to get involved with it. So how do you get your students involved with it? Yeah, so I think it's again, like I said, let me show you the next slide. It's about giving opportunity, like I mentioned. So here are some pictures I'm showing of the uh, engineering students who built our 24 inch uh, telescope. Uh, the optics were refigured by Scott. You know, So when I first came to the U UA, of course, we have a big uh, telescope building program, optical sciences program, astronomy program. Uh, you know, I, I found uh, two 24-inch mirrors that were just lying there. Nobody was using them. They had bought them back in the days. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I said, like, you know, this would be a great idea rather than me going and buying a 24-inch uh, from a vendor. Why don't I try and build this uh, uh, telescope around these uh, mirrors? Uh, and, of course, you know, I, I, you know, sought the help of Scott at Starzona and we checked the figures of these mirrors, and of course, they were terrible. That's why nobody wanted them. They were about a wave, one wave, about half a wave, somewhere there. And, and so the engineering student built the mechanical structure. They designed it, and they got it machined at the, at the university, and they did all the assembly testing and commissioning part. And then, you know, uh, you know, we, you know, got the mirrors done, and then, you know, we got it coded in California. And these are the two telescopes that we use right now. So the, the motivation for the engineering student is the opportunity to build something that is actually going to be used for real research, you know, not some project with, you know, you're doing, you know, hot glue and balsa wood and that kind of stuff, but this is something real that could be used for, you know, uh, research work, you know. And then next slide I show, this is the, uh, the first of the two 24 inch telescope. We call this the Raptor telescope. Uh, my PhD student, Adam, is using this to get a spectra of satellites in geostationary orbit. Now I showed you pictures. If I show you a picture of satellite, you just look like a dot. You know that you can't tell. There's no license plate on it. You can't tell which dot is what unless you continuously keep track of it since the time of launch. And of course, you have to tr keep track of it in the daytime hours, also, right? So that becomes a challenge. So we're trying to take the light coming of the satellite, spread it across many wavelengths using a, a, a like a prism, for example. In, in this case, we use a grating. And we're trying to find unique spectral signatures of their solar panels or the material they use on the satellite. So we're kind of creating a spectral atlas, kind of an, you know, an identification database 
that if you see a dot somewhere else, if you take a spectrum of it, you can immediately say, aha, this one is this satellite because we have a spectrum of it from before. Uh, so that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to do a spectral catalog for all the satellites we can see from Tucson. And this telescope is on a plane wave mount. It's a 24 inch F4.6. It has a relatively narrow field of view, but we don't need a big field of view because most of the stuff we're looking at are in the geostationary belt. They're not moving anywhere. And uh, this, this observatory, it's, it's a roll off on top of the building in, on campus. So if uh, you know, folks, when it's safe to come back to campus, happy to show it around. Uh, it has an FLI 1K by 1K uh, you know, CCD uh, that, that goes to you know, all the way up to one micron. So it has a lot of uh, good uh, quantum efficiency up to the infrared. And of course, you know, the shrouds are the UA colors. You know, of course, uh, always have it, to have the touch there. That's, that's the touch that they have, so they feel a connection. So, that, so the, my students, Adam uses it about you know, 14 nights a month, every month. Uh, you know, well, we run it remote, you know, remotely and robotically. So, you know, at the beginning of the night, we pick the target, you know, go there, focus, make sure everything is working. It runs automated all night. And then you, you know, closes in the morning and then you rinse and repeat. Uh, we try and not observe during bright moon period uh, because we're doing visible wavelength stuff. But yeah, so that's, that's, that's the first of it. Um, the second one we have is a twin clone of that. But in this one is rather than being a German equatorial mount, it's on a fork mount. A uh, one-arm fork mount is the L600 mount from plane wave. Again, same thing. Uh, in this case, uh, the camera is a you know is a 6200 sensor. Uh, it comes from you know many manufacturers. So again, this one we're using to track objects in low Earth orbit, those fast-moving stuff like the ISS. Uh, we're trying to do it again. We can do spectroscopy with it, but on low Earth orbit. And this one is located at the Biosphere 2 location. It's about you know oh, 45 minutes north of uh, campus. And we have about uh, five roll-off roof observatories with different telescopes. Some built by my students, some we purchased, some we inherited. You know, people just you know uh, constantly walk in and you know drop off their telescope. So I, I'm kind of like the no-kill shelter, but for telescopes, <laughs> so I take them and uh, refurbish them. You know, put them to good use for student use and things like that. One thing I notice, and I think most amateur astronomers can uh, kind of empathize, is that it's good to have many telescopes for different purposes, right? Mm. When you have a system, you want, it's dialed in. You don't want to touch it. You're constantly changing a focal reducer or a camera or something like that. It becomes painful. So you want to have your, you know, your wide field telescope. You want to have your nebula telescope. You have your galaxy telescope. So similarly for science, we have telescopes for different purposes. You know, this is a spectroscopy telescope. We have a telescope for photometry, autostrometry, trying to measure the positions and things like that. So. That's why we have multiple telescopes. It's funny to see an L600 look small. Yeah, that's a massive telescope. Yeah. You know, it's scary when it moves like, you know, you know, whatever it is, 30 degrees a second. So. Yeah, I've, I've often wondered if, because if you've never seen a plane wave L mount move, it's, it's quiet and it's fast. And I, I kind of wonder if they tend to keep collimation at the speed that they can throw a telescope around the sky. So. Yeah, yeah. The, the folks from Plane Wave they said this is probably the largest OTA that's on an L600. I think in terms of length, you know. Sounds like a sounds like a challenge for you and your team. So. Yeah, yeah. We we managed to do it. It works great. So you know, there's a there's a uh, rotator on the top and it rotates. It works fine. My students use it from campus from the dorms. You know. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then you. I don't know how much detail you want to go into it. You have your own scope. Um, first I, off, I. I get this a lot because I have equipment that's provided to my outreach programs a lot. And right. people are like, oh, this must be awesome that you get it for free. It's like, that's uh, so far from the truth. I know a lot of your stuff, you're, you're kind of the master at grant writing um, right. to obtain the funds to make this possible. So um, there is a lot of work to back the end result that you see here. So it's not just, yeah, I got it for free. It's Right, a tremendous amount of effort on your part to make this happen. Right, yeah, and also I think you know, folks, you know, the typical grant, the chance of success is about ten percent. So I have to write not ten, you know, ten grants to get one funded. So mm -hmm. nine of mine get rejected. So it's it's that, and also you have to think of the bureaucracy. You know, you, the university is very efficient uh, in general, but it's not like you going on Astro Mart and buying something and shows up next week, right? Yeah, you know? that's. Gotta so go this, a lot this of telescope, yeah, this telescope, for example, took us five years to put together. So, yeah, you know, yeah. So it, it's a slow process, but it's rewarding in the end that 
you know, you work hard, you know, and, you know, something happens and it works, you know, it's like magic, right? You know, so. Yeah, um, it's a, that's also a good uh, example for people who, because I've talked to people who want to start their own outreach program as well. And it is nice when you can get some kind of backing, whether that's financial or equipment or stuff like that. But the big things are, you have to have a good resume to back you up to show that you're legit and you're going to get a lot of people that say no and you just have to kind of persevere through it and you, sometimes something will work out. You only need a yes once, um, but you do have to have the credibility behind you of what your end goal is if you're looking to obtain funding or equipment for a project. Right, right. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, you bring up the outreach aspect. So we are currently, you know, in the process of building a, a 24 by 24. These are 12 by 16 observatories that you see here in the picture on the right. Mm -hmm. We're building a 24 by 24 to the left of it, where this, this gravel is on the left side of this picture. And that is going to have a 36 inch star structure that's going to be an outreach telescope. So that's where the, the, you know, we just took, you know, so again, I went dumpster diving, like, like I usually do at U of A, found a 36 inch blank that nobody was using. Uh, it had already an F3 curve on it. It was, you know, purchased from Newport decades ago, but nobody made it into a mirror. So Mike Lockwood, you know, uh, who, who finished your mirror, you know, who helped you as well, you know, I think he gave you the blank, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So Mike, Mike finished the mirror. We just took delivery of it last week. And, uh, you know, and Star, Star Structure is going to come in the fall and install the telescope. So we're hoping, you know, for me, the way I look at it is that, you know, you can do a lot of science with small telescopes and you can do a lot of outreach also with small telescopes. But for me, the way I look at it is that you, if you really want to get people hooked, you know, the largest telescope you have should be an outreach telescope. So, you know, uh, so that's why we put in a lot of resources. You know, I could have made the 36 inch into a robotic go-to telescope, but having that so there's going to be a little patio on the outside for you know people can gather and stuff like that and you know that's going to be you know a, a go-to telescope and we have those night vision eyepieces that we can oh. put in yeah so yeah can that that's not gonna suck at all so yeah. night vision on a 36 inch it's like yeah well i'm sure i'll have a discussion with you later on about that so yeah we should have that in the fall so let me go to my next slide and so here's an example of the, the Raptors One Telescope with my uh, students. We taught a class and other students all took data from it. Uh, so myself here and then another professor, Walt Harris, uh, we taught this class with this, using this telescope. So it, it gets used a lot. It's amazing, you know, a lot of times, you know, uh, you know, faculty buy telescopes and they don't have time to use it. But in our case, uh, you know, we use it, you know, we get, we get it, you know, it's already paid itself multiple times in terms of science, uh, you know, so to speak. I think it's cool that you do that because when I was looking at going to U of A years ago, it it always seems like the telescopes are kind of put on this top shelf where you can't get to it unless you've jumped through all these hoops. And it just seems very, um, and U of A does a better job than I think a lot of other schools do, but it still a lot of times feels almost unobtainable to get even a chance to use anything. So it's re I think it's really neat that because it is something to be said where you could go to a lab and you could read about it and calculate all this stuff, but it's different when you made it happen from the ground up. It's it's a more personal connection at that point. Yeah, and I think it also has to do with the technology, right? Uh, previously, most of the old teles legacy telescopes, let's say, you know, in the meter, even the 24 inches, they are all, you know, you need to get trained to use them. They're also a little bit, you know, clunky in the sense that you have to physically be there. In, you know, and that's another reason why I chose to go with the technology that's very readily available to amateurs, right? All our telescopes are ASCOM compatible, you know, and, and all those things that, you know, we're leveraging all the things and they've been created to be more user-friendly, which also translates not just for amateurs, but also for students, right? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So they're only there for a short period of time. And, you know, you, want, you don't want them to spend years trying to learn how to use a telescope. If it's in a matter of weeks, that helps that experience that much more enriching. So it's it's I I would you know say that you know we're able to do this thanks to the amateur community that has kind of you know pioneered all these technology advances in the last twenty years. You know, I I really admire what you do with how you do your craft. I think it's amazing how you're able to to really hone in on that, and it's impressive. So I applaud your efforts and 
what you do and how you do it. So. Th thank you. Yeah, it wouldn't be possible with a lot of help, you know. It's, uh, so, but, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, you don't need to play any instrument to be in the orchestra, right? You can play the orchestra. So that's what I do. I bring in the right people. They're all experts at their own instrument or they don't trade, right? But you bring a good group of people and provide them the resources and you, you go off in the background, don't mess with them. Mm -hmm. And things happen. That's why you do. You bring the right students, you know, you bring in the skill set from like local businesses, right? And so for me, it was much more, you know, it made sense that not only am I, you know, helping a small business in, in, in Tucson grow, but also make a deal with them like, hey, you know, I don't know what you guys do, but can you, if I, you know, if we were to buy this from you or something like that, can you help train my students as well? So they get to learn how it's done. Maybe they won't get into the Telsco business, but they appreciate what, what it involves, right? It's to, it's to provide that positive experience while they're here at U of A. So they go off and do other great things, you know? Yeah. Uh, so let, yeah, let me go to the next slide and show you. This is my little telescope. So, uh, so here's here's me. Uh, this was my wife took this picture a couple of months ago. Uh, it's in my backyard in Tucson, so it's like right next to a road, you know. And I had to keep the 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 roof up. It's a ten by ten foot roll off that a friend of mine helped me build. Uh, it's just a basic wooden structure with a garage door opener that's behind the telescope, uh, fan, a little air conditioning as needed. Uh, this one is a 20 inch f 2.8 uh, newtonian uh, this again scott made the mirror uh, a friend of mine donated the blank uh, and it's on a plane wave same uh, a 200 mount it's right behind here i have a little computer but i run it remotely most of the time it has a, a little teleview 102 i use it for wider field imaging not that the 20 inch doesn't have a wide field it has a you know 1.4 by 1.4 degree field of view it has a, a 16 uh, 803 uh, 4k camera on the other side with uh, a giant eight, eight, eight position filter wheel from FLI. And it also has this little uh, piggyback, you know, it's a, it's a ZWO 1600 with a, a Sigma 100 millimeter lens for really wide field stuff we do. And I call this the Leo 20, uh, you know, 20 stands for the 20 inch. And Leo, because my little cat, Leo, his name is Leo. And he loves this telescope because he gets to climb into the tube and look at himself in the mirror because he thinks there's another cat. So let me play with it. So here's, Here's Leo. He looks at it, you know. So, you know, he's curious and then he, he'll jump into it, you can see. So, you know, and that's the probably the largest uh, carbon fiber tube you can buy commercially off the shelf without custom ordering. It's a 24 inch. Yeah. Ah, tube. That's awesome. Yeah. So, anyway, so that's the cat. And, you know, usually he's pretty, he, he realizes within a couple of minutes that. It's just a reflection, you know. Well, there's a there's a cat in your scope. So, anyways, like yeah. catadioptric. It's this is yeah. there. You go. So. Yeah, he does. You know, he's he's pretty light. He's not that heavy, and you know the tube is pretty strong. So, like the secondary does. mirror is probably heavier than he is. So. Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's a massive. I think I don't know what it is. It's a seven or eight inch secondary. You know. So, so any, yeah, so anyway, so this is my telescope. I like it a lot because even though I have telescopes at work, there's nothing like having one in your backyard. You know, you can mess with it anytime, uh, you know. So I do a lot of work for my backyard for work also. So just to let you know. So and there's a lot of stuff you could do with the 20 inch telescopes. And a lot of people don't realize it. Um, it's, it's you know, part of it is the tool, but also is, is the person using the tool, right? Mm -hmm. You have the right experience and right dedication to do work you can do a lot of really great science with small telescopes yeah. that's that's awesome on um, all that i know we're getting to the end here so yeah, i some... have just a couple more slides i think oh know, but... okay yeah, yeah yeah no we've got so, we've got yeah, 15 my, minutes so yeah so my for my work work you know if I, when i don't use the little telescope a majority of my work so i told i talked about the stuff i do for on the space situation awareness for my asteroid work uh, I do spectroscopy of asteroid, which is, like I said, is prospecting what's on the asteroid surface using a telescope. For that, we use the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility on Mauna Kea. I've been using this telescope for, oh, now, you know, probably 18, 19 years. Um, so that's a big, you know, this is the orange, uh, this is the OTA. It's on an English mount, um, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's connected on both ends. Uh, the four kids. And so here's the instrument I use. And so that's me for scale, pretty tiny next to it. Uh, it's a three meter F38, very tiny field of view, but we don't care about the big field of view because we're trying to do spectroscopy. 
and it does a very wide field of view. Uh, to give you a context, it's on Mauna Kea, Hawaii. Uh, here are the Keck telescopes. That's the Subaru telescope. These are the 10 meters, and here's NASA IRTF, the little uh, one with the shiny, uh, you know, steel-like dome, but you, know, you can see it's above the clouds. Uh, I mean, this is actually snow, but usually it's above the clouds. Uh, that's Maui in the back, way in the back. Oh, you know? way, yeah, way back there. Way in the back here, yeah, a few hundred kilometers away. So, and then the other telescope we use here for work that's in Arizona, it's a large binocular telescope that's on Mount Graham. So that's about three hours east of here, uh, just uh, south and uh, west of Safford. Uh, it has uh, two eight meter telescope on a single mount, uh, eight, eight meter F1.14. So these are pretty fast optics. Uh, the camera field of view I put in it, but it has imagers and spectrometers uh, here, uh, and you're literally tiny. Uh, so you're, we use it uh, with uh, adaptive optics sometimes with lasers uh, to do imaging and also doing spectroscopy. Uh, sometimes it's crazy to say, but when we're doing uh, uh, adaptive optics, uh, we use one of the eight meters as a finder and auto guider. Sorry. So we guide with one eight meter and we image with the other side. So I know a lot of people use tiny guiders, but you know, sometimes. When you have the luxury of using an eight meter telescope, we use it as a guide. So that's like the epitome of first world problem, right there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 We have the aperture, so why not? Right. It's there. So. So yeah, and the co align, so I don't have to worry about you know adding more mass. You know. So. Yeah. For those so, of you, um, I'm sorry, Vishnu. Um, for those of you who have watched before, when we had our um, last guest on, who was uh, the director of the Vatican Observatory, the LBT is literally next door to that telescope they're on the same mountaintop so yeah and i mean, used the vat too so but you know um but the slightly bigger aperture but that has better accommodations in terms of when you go there to stay it's like a ski lodge yeah but the, the lbt is pretty spartan in the sense that we use it we use it from campus mostly you know uh, sure. i've been to the lbt but most of the time you just go to campus and use it remotely you know i think that's my last slide but i'm happy to take other additional questions in the last 10, 12 minutes. Yeah. Um, so if you have uh, questions for Dr. Vishnu, now would be the time. I know there's one. Um, says, uh, Dr. Uh, Reddy, is there a follow-up initiative to send a cleaner satellite which can start clearing and deorbiting smaller space junk? Sure. Yeah, that's a very good question. So there are several technologies being experimented right now to remove space junk, right? So you can you, you know, the thing is, you know, if you slow down these objects, they fall back in, you know, and so this me methods where you can you know, use lasers from the ground to slow these objects down and slowly they'll drift down and they will re-enter. There's people using nets to catch debris. There's a whole bunch of, you know, uh, technology being experimented. Uh, and I think you know, folks in the, you know, in Europe and, you know, Asia, for example, Japan are pioneering a lot of this debris removal efforts. What we have been working on uh, in the U.S. side is to see if we can go and refuel these telescopes, uh, and not telescopes, these satellites, I'm sorry, uh, so that we can extend the life. Like I talked about before, a lot of these satellites have perfectly functioning electronics and everything else uh, except for running out of fuel uh, so they cannot maintain their attitude of pointing towards the Earth and locking their you know, an the antennas to transmit the data back to the Earth. Once they lose this, uh, once they lose the, you know, end up exhausting the fuel supply that they were launched with after say 10 years of life. Uh, so we have been, you know, so Northrop Grumman has been uh, 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 launching these satellites called Mission Extension Vehicles, MEV. Uh, they've done two of these where these are like little satellites that would go and dock with the dead satellite. Uh, the, the little satellite would have its own propulsion so they can move them back into the right orientation. And that would help the big satellite reorient its solar panels, get you know, some power back and start functioning again. And then, so, so that's what we were, we're, you know, we're, we're doing that also, so that we don't add to the problem of adding more debris, you know, this debris removal and also this debris prevention. So we're working on both sides. Sounds like they're like little tugboat satellites almost. Yeah. Yeah, fuel pods you can think of, you know, literally going and docking to our satellites and then, you know, giving them the extra life that they could have to function another 10 years. Yeah. Um, the next question is, how do you find or spot these small objects? It's hard. So, you know, uh, for a lot of objects, like I said, you know, in my in, uh, slides before, 
Uh, we track about 25,000 roughly of these objects uh, every day. You know, when we say we, it means the United States uh, Air Force and now the Space Force uh, eventually would track these objects with drone-based telescopes, both in the optical and then also in the radio radar uh, tracking, especially when they're close to the Earth. And so using that, they generate, um, you know, information about where these objects could be. So those are the relatively easy ones to track because we kind of know where they are, where they were at least a, a day or two ago, and you can extrapolate from them. Um, that would be the way. Uh, but, you know, sometimes uh, some, some satellites don't want to be found. Those become challenging. So uh, you basically try and, uh, you know, hunt them down like you, you know, catch anything else that, you know, go to the last known position and then try and sweep it, right? You know, mm -hmm. so we have some techniques to do that. And, you know, you can put a, uh, you know, what you call as an optical fence, you know? So you take, you know, multiple, uh, you know, Rosses, you know, like the Celestron ones or Hyperstars with wide field of view and you align them in such a way that, you know, it's in this plane of orbit, but we don't know the inclination. It could be anywhere. So you put it, uh, you know, align them such a way that the field, field of view overlap vertically like an optical fence and then it'll catch it at some point. And then once you find it, then you track it. So, so there's different techniques you can use to, to find things. You know? Awesome. Yeah. Um, doesn't radiation degrade the electronics of the satellites over time? Yeah, radiation do, like especially particle events from the sun, uh, just like how, you know, uh, coronal mass ejections affect electronics on the earth, especially if they're big. Uh, on the Earth, you don't have the protection of, you know, whatever little protection we get from our atmosphere for these satellites. So that affects particle events are a big deal, uh, both from the sun and also from, you know, galactic uh, cosmic rays and things like that. So, um, so yeah, so they do affect and degrade. So that's why, you know, uh, you know, they, you know, sometimes uh, you have a problem where there's a particle event destroying some electronics. It's harder to recover the spacecraft. Uh, even if you, uh, you know, even if you're fully fueled, so you have to shield these electronics, and uh, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. Yeah, it doesn't, you know. And a lot of times, what happens is that you know, the the what do you call it, the democratization of space, right? You know, you have cheap launches right now. Even high school kids are building, you know, cubesats and things like that, launching. Majority of them are going into low Earth orbit, so eventually they will re-enter and they won't pose a threat as a debris. But some of them are going in higher orbits. And a lot of these small satellites don't have propulsion. So when you have a conjunction where you have the probability of two objects coming really close to the Earth, uh, close to each other, then you have to start worrying about whether they will create debris or not. You know what I mean? Yeah. And a good day, and a good day, you have a conjunction between two satellites that can maneuver. In other words, they have maneuvering capabilities, like they have fuel, so we can contact the person or whoever is the operator of these satellites and say, like, you need to move because we're worried they might collide. On a bad day, you have two debris going at each other. You don't have any control over them. You don't know whose debris they are. Even if you knew, you knew they can't do anything about it. So that's, you know, those are the odds we're playing with. That actually brings the next question, which actually is a good segue. Um, I'm sure you get this all the time. Is Elon Musk Starlink high on your radar or is there a solid maintenance plan associated with it? Is it good yeah. for orbital citizens? Yeah, so so I think you know most of the Starlinks are in relatively low orbit, or they have been. Uh, SpaceX has been pretty good at deorbiting, you know, dying satellites, so to speak, for lack of a better word. You know, they have deorbited a lot of their uh, satellites. I think where mega constellations we call them, right? You know, uh, whether it's Starlinks or the Kuiper that Amazon is going to launch on OneWeb, you know, these are big constellations of hundreds, if not thousands, of satellites, right? The problem we have there is the impact on ground-based astronomy, you know, especially big telescope astronomy, right? When you have things like the Rubens uh, telescope that they're building in uh, Chile right now, it's supposed to, it's an eight meter telescope that's going to scan the entire night sky every few days, right? And you have say a fourth, fifth, sixth magnitude Starlink going by, it's going to ruin the exposure time, you know, the entire exposure because you cannot remove, it's harder to remove that, you know, from an image. Uh, you know, uh, because that's a big survey. They have to stop, wait for the thing to go away, or retake the exposure, and that adds a, a lots of overhead. And again, you know, same thing with amateurs, right? You know, if you're trying to do science and you ruin by again, like I said, we have the luxury of owning our own telescopes. If you're an amateur, then you can take the data again. But for big telescopes, where astronomers have to wait a year to get the time again on these telescopes, and if the exposure is ruined by this, I think that's what I worry about uh, more than anything else. 
And I think, you know, yeah, uh, it would be good if there are more, you know, some kind of guidelines for them. I wouldn't go to the extent of regulation, but some kind of guidelines at least to start with. You know, we don't want to, you know, stop the pro progress of humanity by denying people in remote places, you know, broadband and, and things like that, right? But at the same time, you know, you have to be, you know, be cognizant of the effort, of like, you know, the interest in astronomy, the, the night sky is, you know, an asset that we have to preserve, not just for us, but also future generations. And imagine if everything in the night sky moved because there's thousands of satellites, how would you get, you know, constellations? You can't, you know, so. Well, I know we're at the end of the hour. Um, if you guys have any more questions, now would be the time to ask. Uh, Vishnu, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for uh, spending the morning with us. I know your schedule's pretty busy, so um, I get to meet you in person sometime soon. But um, it's uh, been a privilege to talk to you and kind of tap into what you guys do down there. And I'm glad we got more into the SSA stuff because I think it's really interesting and there's so many people who don't know about it. But uh, thanks for kind of shedding light on that. Uh, thank you, Kevin, and uh, happy to uh, be here and happy to come back anytime, uh, you know, uh, you need me to talk about uh, any topic. So thanks awesome. again. Yeah. All right. Um, well, that's pretty much it. I um, hope you guys have a good weekend. Vish, do have a good weekend. I know it's monsoon season, so I'm sure you're not getting much done down there like we are up here in Phoenix. But um, thanks again. Um, Please have a safe weekend, and we'll see you guys here next Friday for another What's Up webcast. So thanks very much. Take care, everybody.